الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way he deserves to be praised and we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Today in this modern era in these modern days you have old school and new school old school could be cool it could be something that the people praise they say this cat he's old school so like he's still sticking to the you know the history or the the ancestors depending on of course what uh, topic you're discussing and it could be said in a blameworthy sense that he's old school as in this guy is out of it he doesn't know what's going on in the world we're in 2018 he's still living in the 80s and so he's outdated um, when we speak about religion or religious people, irrespective of the religion, at this point in time, whether it is Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, if you try to adhere to some religion, are you automatically cool or the opposite? Be honest. Can you be cool if you're religious? It's very unlikely. The general perception is you couldn't make it amongst the really cool people, so you had to use religion as something for you to hold on to, something to attach yourself to, something for you to overcome your deficiencies in the other social areas. You weren't able to be at par with the rest of the world, so I guess being religious is a safe grounds for someone to continue. But what we fail in recognizing is that all of the problems we have today in the world are primarily because of the abandonment of religion. Religion in general and Islam specifically. And of course it is not surprising to you that I will claim from this place that Islam is the solution. Any, any modern problem today, oppression amongst human beings to each other, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, Children being born out of wedlock, um, the corruption, lying, um, you name it, any type of disease. We say that Islam has the ultimate, undisputable cure for every single disease. And in the, in the process of trying to bring people to understand this, you have to swim against a lot of currents. Meaning for you to deliver this message to the people and maintain a level of relevance to the modern day thinking, there's a lot of effort that you have to exert to try to prove that being religious does not take you out of the fold of normal people. In fact, not being religious is a problem. Because the same people that are anti-religion, the same people that promote uh, extreme liberal thoughts, uh, freedom of speech in every way, shape and form, uh, having absolutely no strings attached, no regulations, no restrictions, live your life as you want it to be, are the same people complaining from the struggles and the diseases that the world is suffering from. So it is a little contradictory. And hypocritical to some degree when you criticize religion for being outdated while religion actually offers you solutions to the very problems you're complaining of the trick though is in identifying and being able to adequately convey to the people how religion actually solves the problem so if, we, if you're asking the question, are we better off with our religion? Absolutely not. In fact, the reason why we are where we are today in terms of corruption and being completely segregated and, and disconnected and humans, you know, dude walk up into a school, shoots another 10, 15 students, some ludicrous stuff. Now you may say this only happens in the States. This happens all over the world. It is highlighted in some countries more than others based on the media. But anywhere you go, the only reason why such nonsense happens is because there's no moral ground that the people can refer to. 
There's no agreement as to what is okay and what is not okay. Where do you draw the line? Your freedom of speech. At which point does it end so that you're not transgressing against others when you're expressing yourself freely? People don't pay attention to that. They just say, you have the right to say whatever you want. If you have no religious values, yes, you have the right to say whatever you want. But at some point, what you say affects others, hurts others, could lead to the death of others. And so who says this is the point at which you can no longer have freedom of speech? Who makes that judgment if there's no religion? It's a never-ending battle. Because it remains human opinions. Depending on the government or the people in charge or the rulers or what have you, everybody has his own standards. And those standards vary tremendously from an individual to an individual, let alone from a government to another, from an era to another, from a time zone to another. All of these are factors in the decision making. So Islam actually addresses every single problem that we suffer from today. And while this is a very big claim, I will try to back it up with evidence. As in, I will highlight the issue and then I will give you references from our revelation. And our revelation is two things. The Quran, the divine speech of the Almighty God, which he sent down to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who in turn conveyed it to mankind and is preserved until today, 1400 years since revelation intact unaltered, unchanged, unparalleled. That's the first source of revelation. And the second is the verbal expressions, the actions and the acknowledgments of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, which was another form of revelation from God. Meaning he would either convey a verse as it was revealed, or he would issue a ruling and his authority is that of God in the sense because God designated him as the, as the one in charge. So when he gave a ruling to the Muslims, it is equivalent to a verse which was revealed in the Quran. So it's very important to understand this. But before I take you into the segments or the areas one by one, let us actually begin with the foundation. And this foundation might be shocking to many of you, but for the most part, you would relate to it because with the passage of time we seem to understand it even better the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the hadith which was narrated by ibn mas'ud ma anzala allahu da illa qad anzala lahu shifa allah has not sent down a disease except that he also sent down a cure for the disease those who know it, know it. And those who don't know it, don't know it. Which means, any type of disease that you see today, be it in a physical sense, a human disease, in the field of medicine, or a social disease, or a psychological disease, or whatever type of disease, if it's existent among humankind, Allah, who allowed this disease to happen, is also the one who sent down the cure. However, mankind are not equal in knowing it. Some people know and some people don't know. And so those who know it are aware of the fact that they have the cure. And those who don't always think that there's absolutely no cure. And while I'm not discussing right now HIV and STDs and these type of diseases and cancer, which someone may argue, well, where are the cures for these? We know that with the passage of time, Mankind continues to make discoveries in terms of diseases that used to kill millions of people back in the day. Now they're cured with a shot, with a vaccination, with a, 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 an eye drop, with a single droplet in your mouth, and that issue is resolved. So it's a matter of progress in the medicine field. But that is not the point of discussion. We are referring to the issues or the diseases that have to do with hurting other people. I don't want to refer to the medical issues. Let us refer to the real issues. The first idea that we should ask ourselves, or the first question we should ask ourselves is, who is most aware of a product? If there's a product in the market, 
and you wanted to purchase this product. Of course, you go on Amazon, you watch, you know, you read the reviews and you do your own little research and you watch a couple of YouTube videos and you surf the net for a few days before you buy an item that is worth five, ten dollars, right? You don't rush into the judgment. You do your study and research to make sure that this item, this product is worth my money. There's a value in what I'm paying for. Who knows the most? If you were to do a research, if you wanted to get the get to the crux of the matter about this product, where do you think would be the source? The manufacturer? Is it fair to say that the manufacturer, if they're intelligent? Because some companies make products and then they, they leave it up to the people, you know, to do all the reviews and, and figure it out. But the companies that want to be successful, they are the first to highlight everything that you need to know about this product. Why? They made it. While a person who is tech savvy can go and get this phone and do all types of reviews and explain it, in reality, he cannot possibly know more than the research and development team that put that phone together, that actually came up with these innovations and these patents. So for sure, the one who knows most about the product is the manufacturer. And unless you want to make this audacious claim that there is no God, the most audacious claim in human history that there is no God. If, unless you make that claim, you will agree then that if you believe that there is a God, then he knows best about his creation. If anyone can give them a formula for success, a, a guideline, a booklet for them to follow, instructions, do's and don'ts, it is ultimately the one who made human beings. The creator of the creation is the most aware of what is suitable for them. The only option left is that you say there's no God, and I think throughout the years, from this very place, we've discussed many times why there's no possibility that you can live your life in the sophisticated manner in which you're living and think that there is no God. That randomness uh, of, of you coming out from some sort of equation or some some big bang because of some molecules with gravity coming all into some sort of big bang irrespective of how the big bang happened let's assume that the big bang did take place who allowed it to take place the the background information that led to this for you to get this result is just mind-blowing to say that there is no designer behind this every single day I see human beings every single day. I go by a building and I see a high-rise building, one of these you know, skyscrapers. Every time I, I board an airplane and I see this guy fly a plane from one country to another, spending seven, eight hours in mid-air. Who made this airplane? A human being. Now, how intelligent can you be? How, how Sophisticated can you be for you to have the, the mechanism, the intelligence, the body parts to be able to build something 500 times your size and manage it and run it in such a successful manner. It's impossible that this came by some random chance. So for sure there's a God. And because there's a God, He knows what solutions we need, what cures for the diseases we need. And he did not leave us unattended. In Islam, he gave us a solution for each and every one of them. But those who know it, know it. And those who don't know it, don't know it. That's what Allah says. أَفَحُكْمَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ يَبْغُونَ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حُكْمًا لِقَوْمٍ يُقِنُونَ Do they seek the judgment of the days of ignorance? Where people have absolutely no law to refer to. But who is better in judgment than Allah? For the people who have certainty in him. So, let's begin with racism, discrimination, nationalism, sexism, and everything that ends with the ISM. All of these issues that have to do with people treating others in an inferior manner because of passport color, skin color, uh, grandparents, father, ancestors, you name it. Is this one of the biggest diseases in the world today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Anywhere you go, you, you, you could be victimized simply by being born in a particular country. You being born in a country makes you guilty by default. 
Your skin color can determine whether you get a job or you don't. Your passport can determine whether you get promoted or you don't. Mind you, your qualifications are not even looked at. All types of other criteria are looked into to judge you and judge me and judge everybody. That is one of the greatest diseases in human history from the time of Adam until now and until the day of judgment. But if you were to refer to Islam and the Islamic teachings, then you will learn the following. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah 49, ayah number 13. O mankind, we have created you from male and female. And we made you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. Truly the noblest of you with God is the most pious. Truly Allah is all-knowing and all-aware. So Allah explained to us that He made this variation. Min ayatihi from the signs of Allah is ikhtilaf, the differences and the variations in your skin color. And in your languages, in your tongues, Allah made this a sign for you to see the greatness of the creation. How human beings can coexist throughout time. The objective behind this variation, however, is that we know one another. Meaning we work together towards a noble cause. And in that process, the most noble of you is the one who is most pious. The one who is most pious, the one who is most righteous in his deeds, the one who is most successful in doing good and abandoning evil in all of its uh, types. Isn't that a wonderful criteria to judge who is qualified and who deserves and who doesn't versus passport and skin color and background and nationality? Absolutely. But mankind today does not want to adhere to those means of differentiating between people. They insist on other types. And the end result is that we suffer from racism until today. And the most advanced countries, Western countries, where they claim that this is the uh, epitome of civilization and modern civilization and what have you, still embedded in the minds of the people is racism. And it only comes out when there's an issue. Meaning, the mo for the most part, everybody is a successful actor. But for the most part, people are successful in acting like, oh, it's all good, man, you're my homie. No issue. But when there's a problem, then you will see the true colors of the people. Then you will find out that there's racism embedded somewhere in there. When they fight, they will tell you, go back to your country. Or, you know, you're from this place. Or you are this, and they start calling you words. You know what I'm talking about. So don't think that because people don't display this 24-7, that they're actually free from this. And I'm not claiming either that Muslims themselves are free from this either. Unfortunately, because of our lack of adherence to our own values, we have fallen into the same trap as the rest. But if we were to abandon this and go back to the teachings, it's beautiful. Where else in the world besides uh, uh, Al Hajj in Mecca, where you can go and see pilgrims from every corner of the earth? from every background, from every nationality, all of them dressed the same, doing the same acts of worship, doing the same rites together with absolutely no differentiation except how fancy your towel could be. Really. Or the slippers that you're wearing with your towel. Other than that, everybody is equal. Some people buy expensive stuff, you know. Or they take like in Hajj, they take four or five extra ihram. Every 15 minutes he changes it. Hajj is meant to be a little bit rough. But anyways, that's besides the topic. Nowhere else do you see this. Nowhere else can you see this. But that's, that's a, a vivid in the Islamic teachings. So if we were to refer to religion, mankind in general, there would be love and harmony between us. When I look at someone, I don't look at his appearance. I try to look at his heart. The more, the more righteous, the more love. I have for that person and the less the less and the fact that you don't love someone does not mean that you go and turn that into some sort of you know violence or that you can take matters into your own hand or you can afflict harm upon someone no 
But ultimately, we love those who are most right, more righteous than those who are less righteous. Why? Because righteousness in the world spreads prosperity among all of us, and evil spreads corruption. ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس. Allah says, corruption has appeared on earth and in the sea because of what the hands of the people have earned. So even when a person is sinning on his own. His sinfulness is actually part of the process of harming other human beings. That earth itself, the environment itself, suffers from the sins of the children of Adam. Furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ said, O oh people, your God is one and your forefather Adam is one. An Arab is not better than a non-Arab. Obviously, he's speaking to the Arabs, and so that is addressing specifically his people. Otherwise, it applies to everybody. That's why he said, and a red, meaning a white person, is not better than a black person. Nor a black person is better than a white person except in piety. So the Prophet ﷺ explicitly and verbally announced to everybody, that you being of this origin, of this background, of this race, does not make you superior to someone else whatsoever, unless you are more pious than that person. So then the, the standard, the yardstick for the better, who is better than the, the other person is ultimately righteousness and not skin color or what have you. That is Islam's address to this issue. Of course, we gave a lecture last year on this. What was it? Against hatred and against racism, which is available on YouTube. So if you want to get a more in-depth look on the topic of racism and how Islam tackles it with more references from the Quran and the Sunnah, then you can go on YouTube and type against hatred, against racism, and put my name somewhere, W-A-J-D-I, and watch that, I think, an hour and a half lecture along with the Q&A, if you have nothing else to do. Secondly, the disease of poverty and the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. Islam looks upon poverty as a dangerous social problem and it, put, it puts man under trials uh, which take him away from his religious commitment, compromising his dignity and his character. It is a potential threat to peace and stability of society. The objectives of the Sharia, the maqasid of the Sharia, for those who don't know, is to preserve faith, to preserve human soul, to preserve progeny, one's children, to preserve property and mind. So Islam, if you look at the legal framework of Islam, what does Islam come to do to mankind? What does it offer you? It offers to protect those five things. I will repeat, your faith, Human soul, progeny, pro uh, property, and mind. And everything revolves around preservation and maintenance of these five objectives. Poverty actually is an issue in establishing or acquiring all of these five. When poverty is prevalent among the people, it is very unlikely that they, some people will abandon their faith in a sense that they will commit crimes of theft and what have you, therefore compromising their religious commitment. Human soul, people who tend to commit crimes will eventually kill someone in the process, so that makes murder more widespread. Uh, of course, the children are victimized. If the father is captured and he's in prison, then the kids now are the uh, victims of the father's actions, and so that affects one's progeny. And then the property is taken away because someone stole it from you and your mind is obviously affected by all of that because you don't have that peace of mind that you need for your survival. So Islam has two approaches to resolving this issue. There is the role of the state and then there's the role of the society. How does Islam treat this issue? The role of the state and the role of the society. The role of the state is one where it is obligatory on the Islamic state and when i speak about islamic state i am not referring to whatever islamic state some you know joe came about you know and discussed a couple of weeks ago because today you could be speaking about like you know generic terms but those generic terms have a meaning a context today 
Meaning some fulan comes up and says, I am the head of the Islamic State, and you think I'm endorsing them. I am not endorsing anybody. We are referring hypothetically, if there was an Islamic State as in the country is run by Muslim rulers, and the people in that country were a combination of Muslims and non-Muslims, under the Islamic rulership, it is the obligation of the state to ensure that the people who are in need are taken care of. It's obligatory on the state to have what they call Baytul Mal. It's a place where the wealth is collected from the rich people and that money is distributed to those who are less fortunate. That's why there came a time in the, uh, uh, the state, the Islamic state, in the early, uh, uh, early years and generations where they could not find a single poor person. They would be searching for a poor person to give their charity, to give their obligatory charity to. They could not find a single person. Everybody was well off. Because the state ensured that the money was being distributed equally. Similarly, it is the state's obligation to provide jobs for those who are qualified. So, in an Islamic ideal system, you don't get hired because your uncle works there. You don't get hired because your uncle works there or because of a connection that you have who goes to the HR and says, he puts a word in for you that he, you know, you're from his side and next thing you know, you got a job with a fat salary when you don't even know how to turn on a computer. And we've met people like that. People that are running high positions in companies that don't even know how to use Excel. They're clueless, but his uncle is connected, his uh, aunt, whoever it is, and the guy gets a job, and someone who's highly qualified, but has the wrong passport, or his uncle doesn't work there, he's dismissed, or they offer him a job with very little salary, that doesn't even pay his bills. This is the world in which we're living today. It's full of oppression of this sort. And so in an Islamic state, in the generic sense of the word, this would never be the case. You will only get the job based on your qualifications. And guess what? If you are unqualified, then you can still survive of the wealth of fellow Muslims. Now the only people who don't like this are the filthy rich people. Wh whose mentality is like, wait, wait, man. I'm working hard for this money. So I work hard for my money and then you give my money to those who are less fortunate. I'm not having that. This is my money. I worked hard. I want to enjoy all of it. We say, if you, would, if you were living on your own in this world, sure. But the truth of the matter is, Islam is a religion that caters for every individual in the society. And yes, it does oblige people to spend some of their wealth on those who are less fortunate. Whether they realize the goodness or not, it is ultimately for their own good. In this worldly life, and in the life to come. Similarly, the role of the society is one where Islam made a responsibility on certain individuals to spend on others, specifically your family members. Meaning in Islam, a son is obliged to take care of his mother. A son is obliged legally, Islamically, to spend on his mother. If his mother has absolutely no source of income, she is dependent, you may not as a son abandon your mom. One will say, but that's not cool because I don't like my mom. In fact, I've never liked my mom. My mom, I'm not talking about myself. But somebody makes a clip from this and then they put it on YouTube. Abu Musab doesn't like his mom. <laughs> uh, and so a person who doesn't like his mom, he says, she's been mean to me all my life. Why do I have to spend on her? Islam, with all due respect, does not look at the exceptions of the rules. Meaning we, we acknowledge our exceptions for the most part. For the most part. Do you, do you guys like your moms if they're around? I would say most people like their moms. Some minority don't. Islam does not pay attention to the minority. Because if you're going to legislate according to the minority, then you have a problem. Then you will have a problem because the majority will be oppressed. The majority love like their parents. The majority of people appreciate their parents. They might not like them. They may have issues with them. But then again, you have issues with your spouse. 
and you have issues with your children, and you have issues with the professor in school, if every time you had issues with someone, this results in not liking them and not being compatible with other people, then go live on Jup Jupiter. And let me know how it is up there with the aliens if they exist. You will have issues with the aliens as well if they do exist. I mean, there's no escape. You will have issues with people. But once parents have such a high position, such high dignity in Islam, that you're obliged to spend on your mom. So that your mother does not have to beg for money or wait for help from outside. And the same thing applies to other family members whom you're able to spend on. This strengthens the bond. It strengthens the family bond instead of the families being separated and, and divided and the kids are kicked out of the house when they're 18 years old or they're told to pay the rent or things of the sort. And the only, the only real connection is on Mother's Day or you know Father's Day or Batata's Day or whatever other day they come up with every other day. I was surprised that there was a... What was the day they came up with recently? Women's Day? Is that recent or old? That's old? Yes, yeah, so I saw a post on Facebook that says... <laughs> says Today is Women's Day. And then the remaining 364 days is Men's Day. I was like, ouch, man. That was rough. Yeah, that was a mean joke. But anyways, you don't need to have a special day for women for a woman to be of value. I hate this day stuff. You know, because it limits, it limits the right uh, that you deserve on yearly basis to a single day. It becomes okay for a son to mistreat his mom and abandon her and yet bribe her with some flowers on Mother's Day. It becomes okay. Even the mother, her standards go down to the level of, it now comes down to Mother's Day. If also on Mother's Day, the son ignored, now we have a problem. The mother herself waits for that day. If she gets no, problem, no gifts, now she has a problem. In Islam, she has a problem every day if you are not giving her her right. That's why the, the Prophet ﷺ said, when he was asked, who has the most right of my friendship? Who deserves to be my closest homie? He told him, your mother. You, would, you don't expect someone to tell you your mother. I mean, you don't want to be friends with your mother. So the companion said, okay, then who? He said, your mother. Two times. He said, then who? He said, your mother. Three times. He said, then who? He said, your father. And after your mom three times, and your father once, now you can start looking for friends. Now you can start saying, my best friend is, you know, Fulan from, you know, class Batikha. <laughs> Until then, you really can't, you, the, your, your best friends should be your parents. But today, this is, if you said this is such a cliche, it's like, this guy, man, how lame can you be? No one dares to say today, my mom is my best friend. Even if she was, they would not dare to say it. Because today, it, being religious is not cool. But we want to promote the idea that being religious is pretty cool. Yeah, my mom is my best friend. Why not? Who, who, understand, who would love you more? Who will give you a more sincere advice when you need one than your mom? Your friend may have ulterior motives. Your friend may, have, your friend may betray you and stab you in the back one day. And how many friendships have ended in the ugliest way possible? After years of being close, one day you get the shock of your life that the person you thought was the closest to you was actually the worst person in your life. That usually doesn't happen with one's mother. It doesn't happen. Your parents have sincere intentions towards you. They brought you into existence and they struggle to keep you alive. So the Islam then solves the problem of poverty by ensuring that the state and the people work together towards eradication of poverty. That's why in Islam, you are not allowed, you are not allowed to take a loan that has interest. One will say, what's the big deal, man? I'm broke. I go to the bank, I get 10,000 ringgits, and then I pay them back 12,000 ringgits. At the end of the day, they spotted me. I needed help, they gave me 10. They deserve the 2,000 extra. Right or wrong? Wrong. Wrong. You are, you are someone who's broke. You need money. Now you have to pay extra money for being broke? Leh. 
It's like someone is in the hole. Wallah, the way I see it, someone fell into a trap. And then they're reaching out for you. Say, hey, take me out. You're like, huh? And you step onto some of a gun and you kill him. Someone is asking you to pull him out of the hole and you like dump a bucket of water on them. How do you like that now, buddy? Or I will take you out, but once you're out, you have to massage my feet for the next three years. I would rather die, ya ammi. Ruh al ammi. What kind of oppression is this? So those people that want to give you money when you need money and then... They say now, give me, my, you're already sitting on so much money. The bank has got so much money. How are you going to ask for more money for nothing? In Islam, we have something called goodly loan. يعني قرض حسن. You need, you need money. Here's the money. Pay me back exactly what I gave you when you're feeling better. I wouldn't give you if I couldn't afford it. True or false? Let's say I have 100,000 ringgits, hypothetically. I don't need 20 of them. I don't need them. If I needed them and you ask me for money, am I going to lend you? No, I'm not going to. I'm sorry. I need the money. I have a business, you know, in the pipeline. I'm about to start a business. I need this money. This is my capital. But hypothetically, I have extra 20,000. I don't need them. Would I be harmed if I gave them to you and then you paid them back to me? Absolutely not. Because I can afford to turn a blind eye towards this money. I don't need it right now. And because Islam upholds and the state is responsible for people to keep their word and to fulfill the contract, I don't have to worry about my Muslim brother stabbing me in the back. Meaning he takes the money, then he runs away. Because we build our relationship on integrity and sincerity and fear of God. I know that if I steal his money now, I would have to pay him on the day of judgment. As a believer, I don't want to pay anybody anything on the day of judgment. Therefore, I am obliged myself before God, that I pay him his money back, exactly as I took it. That is how you help a person who is in need. Interest and usury is forbidden in Islam. Whether you are the one paying it, or whether you are the one receiving it, or even if you're the person signing the contract for that transaction to take place. In all cases, you are blameworthy for helping one human being become more oppressed than he already is. If you want to help someone, you give him money, charity. Say, here brother, this money is a gift from me to you. I don't want anything in return. Or the Islamic State looks after you. Or your family looks after you. Someone is obliged to help you out. When a man came to the Prophet ﷺ from among the Ansar, and he was begging for money, the Prophet told him, go buy an axe, and chop woods, and make your own living. Earn your own living with your own hands. Don't beg for money. That's why Islam does not promote uh, begging. You may not be a beggar, Islamically, unless you have a calamity that befell you and you have absolutely no way out. Otherwise, you're expected to work. People with major disabilities, major disabilities, subhanAllah, people who have no hands, they find jobs where they use their feet and vice versa. Human beings are able to do many things. You've seen some of those things where someone has a job, even though they're physically incapable, they do it better than someone who's fully functional. Let alone someone who has no issues at all. You should be able to get a job. You should be able to work. Even if it's labor work. It doesn't have to be office work. You say, I'm not qualified. No one hired me. A, a, com a construction company will hire you. You have to carry things around and what, what have you. It doesn't matter. You're earning money with your own sweat. It is praiseworthy in Islam. It is honorable in Islam. That you do this. That's how the society is meant to be built. If you want a cure for oppression... Then know that Allah says in a hadith, Ya ibadi inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharrama fala tazalamu. Allah says, addressing mankind, O oh my creation, my servants, I have made oppression forbidden upon myself. And I have made it forbidden amongst you, so do not oppress one another. And that is a beautiful hadith. Because God, by definition, is the most authoritative, is the one in charge. He is the king, the ruler, the one whom no one can dispute with. Get the biggest, most macho man on earth. If Allah, if God decreed for him to crumble and die with a stroke or a heart attack, no one can save him. No one. 
If God decrees that you, your, your heart stops beating, you stop breathing, you can't see anymore, you can't hear anymore, you can't walk anymore, nobody can fix it. Nobody can fix it. It's not, be, it's not within human control. The biggest atheist in the world cannot sit down and say, nothing's gonna happen to me within the next one minute. Not even within the next one second. Allah knows what will happen. And some of the biggest atheists in the world themselves have major disabilities. It's a sign for those who understand. If you were that intelligent, fix yourself. Aren't you so advanced? You figured out that God doesn't have it right or God doesn't even exist? All right, man, make it happen. Fix yourself. Oh, you can't fix yourself? Oh, that's sad. That's a lesson for those who have wisdom. It's a reminder for those who have intellect. Humans are incapable. So God technically, if He wanted to oppress us, no one can say a word. No one can say a word. What are you going to do? You have no power to do anything. So it is beautiful that in Islam, when God speaks of Himself, He says, I have made oppression forbidden upon myself, even though He could exercise this right. And as an extension to that, he has made oppression also forbidden amongst us. So don't oppress one another. So in Islam, this means you may not double park if you're going to block someone from leaving and you double park your car and you block them from leaving, you have oppressed a fellow human being, and this is a crime you will be responsible for on the Day of Judgment. You may say, whoa, 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 wait, man. I've been double parking for three years. <laughs> the same guy too. <laughs> yes, I went to prison for the fight we got into, but gosh, man, take it easy. No, the truth is, we look at every one of those things in a very different way than the rest of people. Because we have accountability in the Day of Judgment, we have a scale, we have good and bad deeds. And the good and bad is between you and your Creator. The, your extra voluntary prayer, your voluntary fast, and what have you, this is between you and God. Even your sins, which you do personally, privately, is also between you and God. And those can fall under the forgiveness of God. Allah may forgive someone in spite of their crime. But what cannot be forgiven is what harms other people. If you harm others, that requires retribution. Retribution on the Day of Judgment. And as the Hadith says, a person will come on the Day of Judgment with mountains of good deeds. Mountains of good deeds. However, he would come having verbally abused one person and wronged another person and stole the money of another person and spilled the blood of a third, fourth person. So on the Day of Judgment, those people that were wronged by that person, they will claim their writes back you oppress me they will take away from that person's good deeds the first person and the second person and the third imagine now the magnitude if they had hundreds of people oppressed so people in a place of authority people that are in a state of authority where they have control over multitudes of people who, whom they oppress imagine their issue on the day of judgment people involved in world wars that led to the death of millions of people. Imagine their problem on the Day of Judgment. The people will continue to take away from their good deeds if they have any, until they run out of good deeds. Good deeds are depleted. It doesn't end. Because they still haven't paid back the people. Now the evil deeds of the people they wronged will be removed from them and it will be placed on the oppressor until he is thrown into the hellfire. Ouch. What else would deter people from oppression? Nothing. No matter how much you lecture about this, if you try to speak to the human consciousness, if you try to speak to people and reason with them, they will hear it and a minute later they will commit oppression within a minute from your speech. The only power that will truly prevent you from being an oppressor is fear of God on the Day of Judgment. Nothing else works. 
and nothing else has worked. So Islam teaches that you deal justly with people, Muslims and non-Muslims. And this is why we repeat again and again, there are many entities, organizations, uh, groups, sects that supposedly represent Islam on some sort of global platform that are involved in the greatest type of oppression in the name of Islam. Any human being who finds it okay for himself to go into a building, blow it up, go into a train, blow it up, go into a church, blow it up, kill any human being walking down the street or what have you, anyone who is involved in this type of crime, we as Muslims are innocent from this guy. And they do it in the name of Islam, and you see it on the news, and then you say, these Muslims are crazy. But the truth is, it's not our fault. You cannot judge the religion according to the actions of certain people. Otherwise, we're not allowed to oppress anyone, including animals. Including animals. You may not use, for example, those who hunt for the sake of hunting, the Prophet forbade that. We do allow eating animals, we're not vegetarians. We're not, uh, you know, against killing animals because we believe they were created for us. They were created for our own benefit. And an animal will die eventually. You can preserve the cow for as long as you want, then it will get some sort of disease and it will die a miserable death. Also, it's gonna die. But God made it for your own benefit. But the means in which you deal with it to consume it, we have very specific guidelines in Islam where we look after even the animal kingdom and the environment in general. So Islam cures oppression. If you want to cure for sexual diseases, adultery or fornication, then know that Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina." Do not even come close to illegal relations, illegal intimate relations. And the Prophet ﷺ advised young men and young women to get married as soon as they can. Haste to hasten in getting married. Because Allah created men and women with a mutual attraction towards each other. There are exceptions to the rule. But for the longest time, it was an exception. Now if a male lacks a female, he becomes the exception. Like, what's wrong with you? Right? Things change, right? Things change. But naturally speaking, there's a mutual attraction. How else can you address this human need through a matrimonial, valid, Islamic marriage? Anything other than that, which is taking place as we speak, has led to all kinds of disasters in the world that we still don't know how else to resolve. You bring the baby, then you abort the baby. So now you have people that are against abortion. Because abortion is killing a soul and they have their reservations. So some are for it, some are against it. Go back in time, why is that baby there to begin with? Because usually for a married couple, that's not something on the list. It's very unlikely that they would need an abortion. But abortion usually takes place between two couples that are not ready for a child. People that are not married. So Islam addresses the issue from the core. Because if you don't address it from the core, whichever direction you go, you have a problem. If there's no baby involved, there are sexually transmitted diseases. Or the, this, the culture, the the nature of people, the environment becomes very unhealthy. It promotes the, object, the uh, objectifying women. Women being treated as, as a lesser gender in a sense that she's looked at strictly, strictly from that sexual point of view. And don't claim that this is not the case today. Don't even claim that this is not the case today. While some women fight against that, the truth of the matter is, in a predominantly male world, the women are looked at exactly like that. 
only in an ideal Islamic society, not this Islamic society, again, the generic sense of the word, you don't have this kind of thing. It's, it's there, but it's minimized, it's marginalized. Because Islam has certain guidelines to protect both the male and the female. And so Allah says in the Quran, in Surah al nahl God has made mates for you of your own nature. And made for you of them children and grandchildren and uh, prosperity. And provided for you sustenance of the best. Are you then going to believe in vain things and not be grateful to God's favors? So from the signs of Allah is that He made this kind of relationship which results in the reproduction of progeny and, and generations to come after. This is from the signs of Allah. People abandon marriage and then they resort to other means of having relationships and those relationships often end in some sort of disaster. Either a disease or a child born out of wedlock or the disagreement of the parents or somebody has to quit school because they got pregnant or they couldn't continue their education and the list goes on. Children, of course, who are born don't know who their fathers are. They're not sure actually who the father was. There are like seven, eight different options. One of them could be the father depending on DNA test if the hospital didn't make a mistake. So there's, there's all types of issues that cannot be resolved unless you allow Islam to treat it. You may say, but if you let Islam take control of these things, I mean, life is going to be rough. And I will say yes. That's a good point. This life is meant to be rough because we were not born to live this life only. If this was going to be our only place of residence, I would agree with you. But since this is only a phase, in fact, it's a very short phase, versus eternity, it's worthwhile. It is just like you studying your behind off now so you can graduate with honors and have a high paying job. It's the same thing. You can go through school years relaxed, chilling, barely surviving, barely passing, and you graduate and you could bust your behind off and work really hard and be the top student in your class and be at a completely different level. And you will say it's completely justifiable that I struggled for four or five years of university for me to get to be comfortable later on. And we say as Muslims, it is completely reasonable that you struggle in this life while you are alive so that you can earn your place in the life to come. It's the same mentality. If you can do it regarding your education, you can do it regarding your life to come. If you want a cure for alcoholism and drugs, then know that Allah forbade the consumption of alcohol. Allah says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu innama al-khamru wal-maysiru wal-ansabu wal-azlamu rizsun min amali shaytan fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun. Or you have believed intoxicants, all kinds of alcoholic drinks, gambling, and seeking arrows for luck and decision are all the abomination of Satan's handiwork. So avoid it strictly in order that you may be successful. And in another ayah, Allah mentioned that in gambling and alcohol, there's some good and there's some bad, but the bad, the evil outweighs the good. And this is an Islamic guideline. Sometimes there's something that can be legislated that is purely good. And sometimes something is legislated where the good is superior to the evil. And sometimes something is legislated where the evil is superior to the good. In which case, it becomes forbidden. That would be the ruling in Islam. If the evil is superior to the good, it's no longer allowed. If it's purely evil or the evil is superior, it's not allowed. If it's purely good or the good is superior, it is allowed. And that is a very fair way in looking at things. And so when it comes to gambling, someone could say, look man, I have a hundred ringgits. I go to the casino. I play, I come out rich. True or false? Who said true? When was the last time you made money like this? <laughs> last guy I met is broke until now. It happens, no, seriously, it happens, right? Some people buy a lottery ticket and, and they hit the jackpot. But what about the rest? Most people lose their money gambling. And the same thing with alcohol. 
You could make money from selling alcohol. It's a good business. Selling alcohol is a very lucrative, profitable business. I'm not encouraging you by any means. There's good in it. Or someone who's, you know, tensed and they, you know, sip on some wine and they chillax for the rest of the evening. It's also good. But the harm is greater than the good. Those are the same people that then go out into the car, has no idea what he's doing. Instead of putting the car in drive, he puts it in reverse and he runs over three people on the bicycle behind him. Or he goes home, fights with his wife, divorces her. Or shoots one of his children. I mean, the stories are endless of drunkard, drunkards and drunk people going, going crazy and berserk because of the level of intoxication that they're in. And it's very interesting that the, uh, in the U.S., the, uh, the issue of alcoholism had reached such grave stages that in 1918, uh, they actually had a constitution to ban alcohol. That lasted 14 years. And then it was eventually removed. In these 14 years, it became the most illegal business you can be involved in. Meaning the people were not ready because it was imposed by the government. The people were not ready to abandon alcohol, so now they found other ways. This led to even more corruption, where now they're dealing with you know, businesses and all types of uh, wrong transactions, selling it illegally and what have you. Whereas if you look at Islam, in the beginning of the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad, alcohol was allowed. The companions of the Prophet were still drinking alcohol in the early stages. Alcohol only became officially forbidden towards the end of the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. But the society had been prepared spiritually to the degree that when the verse was revealed from God that issued that forbiddance of the consumption of alcohol, the one I recited upon you earlier, I recited to you earlier, when the companions, some of them had the glass of wine to the, to the mouth. And then a caller came and said that a verse has been revealed that rules alcohol as forbidden to consume. Most of us would say, last one. <laughs> last one. Right? Keep it real. I mean, come on. I will apply it five minutes later. The level of Iman and faith they had is that they, they removed it off their lips and they spilled it on the ground until there were rivers of wine in Medina. Rivers of wine. Because everybody went to their jars and the jugs, everything they had that was full of alcohol and they dumped them. Why? The ruling was revealed. So when it was legislated by God to the creation based on faith, they were able to adhere. When you try to impose it on people otherwise, it didn't work. And the same applies for drugs. If you want a cure for lying, then know that Allah says, Ya amanu taqullaha wa kunu sadiqeen O you have believed, be mindful of Allah and be among those who are truthful. And lying is forbidden in Islam. You may not lie. The, the exceptions for lying are very, very minimal in very specific conditions between specific individuals. Otherwise, the fundamental principle is that you may not lie. Today, most people lie around the clock, compulsive liars. From the moment he wakes up until he goes to bed, he probably lies 50, 60 times. In Islam, you would have to hold yourself accountable for each lie. And when you know that you may not lie, you imagine if there was that transparency amongst humans, how wonderful things would be if we were all honest with each other. But unfortunately, we live in the times where lying is prevalent and it has led to a lot of corruption, especially among politicians. If you want a cure for murder, then know that Allah forbade the killing of souls. And do not kill the soul which Allah has made forbidden except with a just cause. Meaning Islam made certain crimes deserving of the death sentence. Yes, 
I'm not shy or afraid or I'm not the sugar coating type who's gonna you know, sweep it under the rug to make anybody happy. Islam legislated with certain crimes that you get the death sentence. You don't want it, don't commit the crime. Very simple. You don't want to be killed, don't kill nobody. In Islam, if you kill someone as a murderer, your life is just to be fair. You took someone's soul, your soul should be gone too. Not for me and you to take it into our own hands, but in an Islamic uh, uh, government, they are the ones to implement this amongst the people. And because of that, crime in Muslim countries from back in the days until now is way less than countries where you know that you will go to prison, where they have a gym. And uh, you know, they're crazy, man. You go kill somebody, then you go to prison, you eat three meals a day, you get buff, you get a degree. Some of these guys get a degree, man. And he becomes more educated than you are. Comes out of prison, Asal. <laughs> get him in. Isha, the Abu Inta, in prison, you're a, you're a criminal? The mom's struggling outside, I can't even buy a sandwich. Go kill somebody, man. That prison down the street is off the hook, five stars. It's crazy human beings, man. If you knew that you would be killed, if you were to kill someone, Wallah, you would think a million times before you pull out a gun or a knife or even get into a street fight. Because in Islam, there's retribution. There's retribution, there's payback for your actions. And so that keeps you in check. It keeps you in check. And that is what has kept Muslims in check all these years. And the Prophet said, The believer remains within the margin of his religion unless he spills illegal blood. Meaning once you get into the business of killing other human beings, you're basically kissing your religion goodbye. You are on the verge of leaving Islam. Because getting involved with crime, be it with what you consider to be a lawful reason or, or an unlawful reason, both are Islamically unacceptable. And what I mean by lawful meaning someone believing based on misinterpretations of textual evidences that it's lawful to kill other people. And you will not find that justifiable within the teachings of Islam. <clears throat> but you will find false interpretations among the people. Anybody can interpret anything the way they want if they want to find a reason for it. So you have to be very careful where you get your information from. How about the disease of love for power and dominance and obsession with the material world? Material world. Allah says in the Quran, تِلْكَ الدَّارُ الْأَخِرَةُ نَجْعَلُهَا لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُرِيدُونَ عُلُوًّا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فَسَادًا وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ The home of the hereafter, paradise, we shall assign to those who rebel not against the truth with pride and oppression in the land, nor do mischief by committing crimes. And the good end is for the pious people. So Allah told us in the Quran that those who seek dominance in this world on the expense of hurting other people, the life to come is not a sign for them. You can have your fun now, or you can have your fun later. And each one of us has the same choice. Right now, you have the same choice. You can either get married and have fun, or you can have fun now, before you get married. However, however, history has proven that when you try to have fun prematurely, it doesn't end up fun at the end. It does not. It comes with its own issues. And so similarly, in this worldly life, you can go all out. You can have a party from the day you're born until you die. You can die partying. You could die at the club with a tequila in your hand and a girl by your side and a blunt sticking out of your mouth. You could. And you could have partied your whole life. But once you leave this world in this condition, you cannot come on the day of judgment to God and say, hey, Where's my portion of the life to come? Where's my house in paradise? You didn't do anything for that. So we learn to give up things that we like. No doubt, no doubt. A lot of the things I mentioned that are prohibited are desirable. It's something that you like, you're a human, human being. But we are taught in Islam to give up on certain things so we can earn them and enjoy them rightfully in the life to come. 
only with this mentality you can stay away from that obsession with dominance and overtaking others and ruling others and oppressing others in the process by having your eyes on the prize in the life to come and lastly last but not least if you want a cure for godlessness and atheism then know that Allah says in the Quran فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ مِنْهُ نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ so run to your God don't just walk run as in exert and strive and make effort towards reconciling your relationship with your creator because verily I am to you a clear warner and anyone who recites this verse is technically a clear warner to other mankind today we are living in a time where atheism is widespread and this is causing a lot of the loss of morals that humans once adhere to and just because you have people that are strongly opinionated about it or people that are passionate about it it does not make it right meaning i'm not afraid to speak out against it simply because there are many people that feel very strongly about atheism and they are offended by the topic because many people feel very strong and passionate about burgers and eating unhealthy food does that mean that all those who promote healthiness and a healthy lifestyle and diet should go and close the door and sleep? Because some people like to eat whatever they want. They can tell you, man, that's not all your business. I want to eat whatever I want to eat. It's my body. Sure, enjoy your meal if you're going to enjoy it. But I have the right to tell you that this is not good for you. And while atheism is becoming widespread to the point that it's, it's surrounding us, and you're becoming a minority amongst the majority, it doesn't mean that we're gonna give in and surrender, say, okay, it's okay, Malish, we understand. No, sorry, we don't understand. We don't understand. And we will not understand. And we don't have to understand. Because we didn't understand before. Why is it okay now? The majority of mankind have believed in God. It's in the natural disposition. Why today has it become a crime? To be a believer in God. And why is it okay for one to promote atheism and it's not okay for one to promote theism? Why the double standards? If you can speak strongly about your rejection, we can st speak strongly about our affiliation. And my advice to everybody is if you're going to expose yourself to information, you can go far astray. Trust me, any subject matter, any subject matter that you search online, you will find at least five conflicting opinions. Peanut butter. I, wanted, I used to buy a brand of peanut butter. And I thought I was getting the top of the line, the best type in the world. A friend at work told me this stuff has hydrogenated oil. I'm like, okay. I went online, did the search, found out that there are disasters behind hydrogenated oil inside you know food products you probably thinking what the heck is he talking about it's okay if i was reading the early reviews of that peanut butter i was getting man i was promoting it amongst everybody i knew don't get the regular one which has added sugar and doesn't have enough protein and blah 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 Khali wali. pay another extra 20 ringgits or 10 ringgits and get this brand turns out that this brand is garbage and there's another brand that has purely peanut butter and sea salt. No added oil, nothing else. And it tastes 20 times better than the one I was buying and it costs the same. So when I thought I had it all under control and I've done my research and I know what's up, because I knew better than the person who was getting the regular peanut butter off the shelf, it turns out that I'm ignorant. And someone knows way better than me about this area. And that's just an example that you can relate to. If you try to learn your relationship with God from what the people have to say about it online, you will never identify yourself with anybody. I tell you, speak to yourself. Have an internal conversation with yourself without any bluffing, because you could bluff people. If you're an actor, you could shed tears right now for no reason, without onions. 
You'll just cry. If you're a good actor, people can pretend in front of others that they feel very strong about their lack of belief or the non-existence of God or the doubt about the existence of God. Cut that crap. Talk to yourself inside before you have allowed yourself to become extremely corrupt. Do you really think that you came by some coincidence? That there's no designer behind this, this system in which we're living? The distance of the sun from the earth for vegetation to grow through a process that involves water and soil. It's mind-blowing. If you look at any animal, any animal, how it functions, how it feeds itself, how it protects itself, any fish in the sea, any scorpion, any, anything, you're mesmerized. Just watch Animal Planet for 15 minutes, wallah. I just, I'm, I'm baffled when I see a, a lion, you know, chasing a, a deer. How, how do these things function, man? How does, it, how does the system work? Let alone human beings. You can't, you can't deny it. And so it is time for people to believe in God, to adhere to a religion moderately. Our obligation as Muslims is to learn Islam as it should be learned and sharing it accordingly with the people. So they don't have all these misconceptions about our religion. And the responsibility of the others is to look into Islam from the perspective of the teachings and not what the media is spoon feeding them through the propaganda against Islam. If mankind were to work together, then we can fix 80%, 100% of the problems, but you know, this is not paradise. So we will forever have issues, but we will have way less issues than we have today. So it is obligatory on us to live by these rules and to share them with others with decency, with kindness. You can't impose these on people. You can't shove, shove it down someone's throat. They're not going to accept it. But if you explain it to the best of your ability, and if you live by it first, then Allah is the one who guides the heart and the hearts of people. I ask Allah Azza wa to guide all of our hearts and to make us among those who listen to the reminder and follow the best of it. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد